you think, oh, they must be great people to serve? Let me tell you. When Cinderella, you see her in there with all her makeup on and her jeans or whatever, she's not too happy. So they must do all their happiness out there, and when they're behind the scenes, they're not the nicest people. So, you know, again, perception, right? My perception's my reality, your perception's your reality. We all have our own perception, our own reality. Um, that sunset is the actual sunset that happens in Naples, Florida, because you happen to be on the Gulf of Mexico. So this, the sun goes right down into the Gulf. Quite beautiful. I'm left-handed. Um, as you said before, I went to RIT. Um, at that time, when there wasn't many schools that even had a bachelor's in hotel and restaurant management way back 100 years ago. Um, I love to collect watches. Um, I love to collect seashells. I like to also collect rocks that are in the shape of a heart. Now, that doesn't mean to go in a store and buy them, but if I see them on a beach or wherever I go, and I was very tempted on my two-hour drive here, all those rocks, I was like, okay, maybe I should just pull off. Maybe I can grab one and say I have my rock from Arizona. Um, and you'd be surprised how many rocks you can find in the shape of a heart when you start looking for them. Um, and I figured it's free and nothing doesn't hurt anybody, right? So I can take a few rocks. Um, I like to djembe drum. Any djembe drummers in the, in the room? All right, we got one back there. So djembe drumming, right? I thought, what the heck is that? I was doing a team building one time, and one of my managers said, hey, we're going to do a drumming circle. I think a drumming circle, you know, what the heck is that? So we're up on a mountain in Pennsylvania having this meeting. We hired somebody, and he brought all the drums for us, and that's a djembe drum. And you play it with your hands. And so somebody starts the beat, and then before you know it, everybody starts the beat. And I tell you, after 10 minutes, we were ready to make a CD. And I thought, well, this is pretty amazing stuff. So don't you know, three weeks later, I moved to Naples, Florida. What's on the Naples Daily News? There's a drumming circle in the park. Now, I'd never heard of it, had never been exposed to it, I had just done it, so I said, well, I guess I have to go down to the park. I go down to the park, I see the guy's picture in the paper, I recognize him, I said, oh, I saw the article, he built me that drum. So, and I would go down to the park every week, and I'm basically an introvert by nature. Most people think, oh, there's no way, because you do this kind of work, but this is in your MySpace now. Um, but I'm not real comfortable, so I'm usually an introvert. So for me to show up with people I did not know, People from all walks of life, young, old, you know, every spectrum. Musical talent, I have no musical talent whatsoever, but I can follow if somebody starts a beat, I can follow and I can listen. So it's a really good exercise to listen and to watch. And so I would show up. And it would just, it would just be amazing how nobody would speak. Somebody would just start the beat, and before you know you had 50, 60 people drumming. Oh, what, the maracas, who's doing it? It was an unbelievable experience. So, you know, and I tell you that because as an introvert, sometimes you have to put yourself out there where you're not comfortable. And I know as students and in the world where you live and where do you want to go and, and as you graduate, you know you have to put yourself where you're not comfortable. Because you have to be uncomfortable before you can be comfortable. And my, the reason I have the four-leaf clover there um, is not because my father doesn't like Irish people, uh, but it's because when opportunity knocks, you can't be in the backyard looking for four-leaf clovers. So tonight you're here, whether it's for extra credit, for food, or just some place to go tonight and sit, I don't know. Um, but you know what, opportunity knocked and you took it and you're here. So hopefully you take something out of this presentation. So imagine if each of you took one thing out of tonight. Imagine what a better place NAU would be tomorrow, right? Putting away the biases. So I have to clarify when I said my father doesn't like Irish people. So before I started doing diversity work, I didn't realize about bias. Right? And you have those biases, but it's not something we ever talk about, right? I've yet to sit in a meeting where we say, well, let's go around the room and share your name, where you're from, and tell us, tell us the bias that you have. And so as I started doing that work, I realized, uh, here's my father, 88 years old, always about the Irish. So growing up Italian, it was the Italians against the Irish. They were this, they were that, they were no good. And to this day, he still talks about the Irish. And so probably before I had that awareness, I probably would not hire somebody that was Irish or looked Irish because I hear my father. And but once I became aware of that bias, I'm like, you know what? Okay, Pop, I hear you, but times have changed and you know we have to give everybody a chance because I can't just judge somebody because they have an Irish name or they look Irish, just like I said to you. Just because you see my name, my age, whatever, you want to put me in that proverbial box. So I uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. I drive a Mini Cooper convertible. Um, a lot of times if I ask people what I drive, they think a Cadillac. Don't know why. I guess it goes with the Italian, big personality, you must drive a Cadillac. No, I drive a Mini Cooper. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I just took a new job in Sodexo, actually, two months ago, and packed up and moved to Tennessee. 
So imagine me going to Tennessee. As soon as I open my mouth, they're like, you're not from these parts, are you? I'm like, no, nope, that's good observation there. Um, so I became a district manager, and I manage 15 um, independent schools now, which are K-12 through private or boarding schools where we do food service in. So I travel all over Tennessee, and I, I was having a little anxiety uh, last night, you know, getting ready for today, because in my previous job, I used to fly every week across the country, or wherever. And so I haven't flown in a couple months, and I'm kind of out of practice. And I already got I'm going to the airport, and I'm like, well, I forgot my headphones. So I had to buy headphones when I got to the airport. And I'm like, okay, what else did I forget before I get here today? Um, so it's, it's, it's a world of opportunity. Somebody said, well, why would you leave that work? It was so, so rewarding. I did it for five years. It's time to pass the time. It's, like, it's time for me to take what I've learned in that job and put it in the new job. So, um, uh, and I know this, these two things always just don't get a good, uh, a good hurrah either. Is I, I adopted the Florida Gators when I moved to Florida. I know, I know. It's like a New Jersey thing. And I had to, I had to, you know, adopt University of Tennessee. I happen to be an orange fan. I like anything orange. So okay, it is what it is. But it's my thing, and so it's okay. Um, I love popcorn. It's my my favorite snack. And uh, and I love Snoopy, and I love Charlie Brown. So again, you know, you probably wouldn't have known those things about me had I not shared my story. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more as I weave in the Sodexo story and why this matters. Because so often, um, if you can really get to know somebody and you can find, how many, how many people look at these things here and you probably found something you had in common with me? Anybody? Right? So probably when you looked at me in the beginning thinking, I don't have anything in common with her. But look how many things we have in common. And when you can find that common thing, like when I bought the Mini Cooper, the reason I bought the car was because they, they're very big in community. They love to do things, and they wanted to be in a car club. Well, the car club was defunct. So they said, why don't you start it? I'm like, well, I really want to start the car club. But I started the car club. And people from all walks of life, from kids in high school, all the way people in their 70s that traded in their Harleys to get a Mini Cooper. And so again, it brought people together because we had this one thing in common, a car. And then that led to these great relationships as the club evolved. So again, think about this and think about the clubs and the things that you belong to. And, and again, um, just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so a little bit more about Sodexo. So here's some headlines. Uh, D&I, as we've referred to as diversity and inclusion, right? Thought leadership is a really key component to our brand. If we're just gonna hire the same people and have that same thought, we're probably not gonna have uh, be the company that we are today. Um, it's also a catalyst for business growth. If we truly want to grow a business, like with NAU here, you know, NAU can tap into the partnership they have with Sodexo. So as you all are starting on your journey and hiring a chief diversity officer, there's no reason why our chief diversity officer couldn't come here and sit and talk and say, okay, so what can we do? How do we store? Where do we want to go? How do we do this? Um, it provides access to key decision makers. So for us, in our business, it's very tough to get to the president of a university. But sometimes through our DNI and our accomplishments, it's easier to get in because people say, wow, look at them. Not only are they a food and facility management company and all the other things they do, but they are a leader in diversity and inclusion. And we didn't get there easily. Um, it also helps us create a culture of inclusion. So if I ask you this question, you don't necessarily have to raise your hand, but how many of you actually feel you can bring your whole self to work each and every day, right? Um, I could not bring my whole self to work with Sodexo my first 13 years because we didn't talk about being gay. That was only 13 years ago, 12 years ago. We did not talk about it. We just went about our business. So imagine me flying all over the country doing training and development, and I can't tell anybody about my story that I've been with my partner for 20 years. Nobody, you were afraid. And so we've come a long way with that. However, we still have a long way to go. Um, and then our DNI commitment really aligns to our values as a company. So here's, here's the challenges of it. We are a huge company, right? We have 6,000 locations just in the U.S. plus 80 countries. Now, diversity isn't always such an issue when you get out of the U.S., but here it's, it's a big darn deal, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, we are a guest in your house, right? So us providing food services here, we're in your house. 
So how do our employees align with the values and things that are going on at NAU to what Sodexo says? So it's, it's a challenge for us. Um, it's a very male-dominated industry, right? Uh, generally, when I started, it was all white men. And that was it. And you know, Bill Denise, you go over there and you can run this little place, but you can never be the boss. Um, we work on very small margins. You know, we're not selling anything. We're selling stuff to you, but we work on very small margins. So for a company of our size, working on a very small percentage of profit to invest in diversity and inclusion is a big darn deal. Because in many companies, diversity and inclusion is part of human resources, but for our company, it stands alone. Because we wanted it to be separate, we didn't want it to get money in the waters of HR, because there's so much that goes on with HR. And here's the, here's the big piece that started us on our journey. We got sued 13 years ago by our African-American managers. They said they were not being promoted at the same rate as everybody else. And if the truth be known, that was the truth. But also, nobody was being promoted except white males. So as a company, the CEO at the time had the wherewithal to say, you know what? We got 135,000 people in the US. We gotta do something about this. And not because we were sued, but we have to, we have to take a hold on this. And so hence we started on the journey and said, okay, so before this lawsuit, it was a class action lawsuit, it was a big darn deal. And long before the lawsuit even settled, we, were, we had far surpassed anything they told us that we had to do because we realized it. And now we are a leader in the space of diversity and inclusion. So it becomes a real differentiator for us because when you look at anybody in the hospitality industry, you look at Disney World, Disney World is not even close to where we are. And you would think Disney World, right, because they're all happy, right, everything is so wonderful. Behind the scenes, it's not so. So again, you know, companies struggle, whether it's companies, schools, hospitals, everybody struggles in this space. But we took a stand on it, we invested in it, and we said we will continue to invest in it. So when I went in that role five years ago, that was a brand new role, and we said we gotta get somebody out in the field that can relate to the people in operations and, and help them to understand why diversity and inclusion is so important. Because otherwise, how do we do our business? If I'm a manager and I don't provide an environment of inclusion for my people, how can they be the best they can be? Right? If we don't provide that on this campus to ours, what do we have, 700 and something employees you told me, Ben, right? How can we take care of you? So, right, it all starts with that. So, um, and we're globally based in France. Sometimes people don't look at that as a good thing. It is what it is, but nonetheless. I'm also happy to report we're celebrating our 50th year this year. And Pierre Milan, who started the company, is just retired. And he said to his three children who work in the company, actually work jobs, not just you know floating around at the top. And he said, you figure out who's gonna be the CEO. I'm retiring in two years. I left it up to the three kids. And so his, uh, his one daughter uh, ended up being the CEO, and they just did an interview with the both of them. And again, you know, you see this interview, it's just like a family. It's like, and I've met him numerous times over the years, so he's probably in his 80s at this point. But he started this company on the ships, small ships in France 50 years ago. And look what he's grown. We're over $7 billion just in the US. So you want to think about opportunities for jobs. Right? There's so many different things that you can do in a big company like this. So we had to start somewhere, right? So because of the lawsuit, we had to start with compliance. We kind of had to mandate things. We had to force our managers to take certain training. Uh, we developed an eight-hour um, spirit of inclusion class to educate people on diversity and inclusion, to understand what it really means. You know, we have to be able to walk the talk, not just say, okay, I did the training, check. We need to change the culture. How do you change the culture of 135,000 people across 6,000 locations? And there was one of me for all of universities as well as uh, K through 12 in the US. One person. We definitely changed the culture, one by one. If I get to one of you in this audience tonight, that's one more that kind of gets the story of that. Um, then we started creating awareness. We started developing training. Uh, so we have like nine learning labs now on all different topics gender, race, sexual orientation, to let people understand what this all means. Because again, we've kind of grown up, right? You've heard your grandparents, right? Your parents, maybe aunts or uncles. People have biases, right? All this stuff comes in, right? And what do you do with it? 
And so we needed to tell people, hey, it's okay to be biased. 